What did your job want you to hide from customers? My brother and I worked for a junkie who happened to be surprisingly functional. He owned a number of auction houses. My brother and I would do everything for his business, maintenance, janitorial, carpentry, plumbing, loading, unloading trucks, displaying merchandise during callouts, think Vanna White. We would even drive his wife around when he was too baked. I have a million stories from this place, but two instances stood out that applied directly to the title. So one of his auction houses primarily sold furniture, everything from office chairs, etc., but mostly couches. So we got a living room set in one day, love seat, couch, rocking chair, and it was mismatched. Just the colors were different, but unfortunately that it meant it was going to be extremely hard to sell the individual pieces. So the owner, Rob, because screw it, that's his name, Rob decided he wasn't going to lose a sale and in a substance-inspired haze ordered me and my brother to spray paint the entire set gray. Not any fancy spray paint, just regular old rustoleum gray. So we did it. My brother and I spent like three hours putting layer after layer of paint on a living room set. Have you ever tried to spray paint fabric? It really doesn't work, especially after it dries. So the day of the sale happens and me and my brother are sweating bullets over this disgusting looking set, like the paint is all sloughing off in huge chips. There's gray dust all around this thing. Then someone buys the freaking thing as part of a lot. Fine, right? No, not fine. We have to load these freaking things. Towards the end of the night, Rob pulls us to the side and explains he has made sure the buyer of the silver set would have his trailer at the dock first and that we were to load the silver set first. Obviously, Rob wanted this crap hidden deep in the bowels of the customer's trailer. See, many of our customers were out of state, so there was almost no chance this would come back to bite Rob as long as we could get it on the trailer without anyone knowing. So we did it. No idea what happened once the customer found out, but his entire trailer bed was covered in silver flakes as were my brother and I. So we got a huge shipment of mane and tail shampoo too. It's this horse shampoo that people started using for themselves and now it's primarily a people shampoo. Anyways, Rob hatched a master plan. See, he was going to have my brother and I empty each of the bottles into these large water fountain jugs, then refill the empty bottles with water, reseal the cases and sell them to an out-of-state buyer. So we did it. Hours it took us and holy crap, the mess, soap freaking everywhere. There must have been two to three hundred bottles of the soap. We filled, I think, a dozen or more water jugs. And long story short, the water sold and we never heard back from the buyer. However, that's not really what makes this story funny. You've seen that South Park episode with the underpants gnomes, right? Familiar with the meme, step one, steal underpants, step two, question, step three, profit? That's exactly what was happening. Rob had no end game planned here. We stole all this frickin' shampoo and he was mumbling something about selling it, but he had no plan for that. No way of getting the soap back into containers or like a sales pitch or anything worked up. Nope, we just took all the jugs of soap, placed them behind the auction house, and that's where they sat for many years. The liquids slowly separated until each container looked like some mad scientist goo. The whole thing was completely pointless. Well, it sounds like working for that type of person sure is a blast, but probably a different story from buying from that kind of person. Story 2. I was a server at my first restaurant a few years ago. You got crap for calling in sick, even if you were legit sick. If you were sick, they would tell you to go to the bathroom and do what's needed, but get back to work ASAP. If you went to the bathroom too often, sneezed and coughed, or did anything sick people do in front of customers, you got scolded. Everyone freaking hated that manager. I tried calling in one time because I was struggling to survive. I was spewing and pooping every 30 minutes. They were so pissed off because no one could cover my shift and said if I went home, I would regret it. When I started work, I looked and felt like death. The first table I went to was a party. This lady said, you don't look good. You need to go home. And when I responded, I'm okay. No one can cover my shift and I need this job. She got up and told me to follow her. As we were walking, she asked why I felt like I was going to get in trouble. She flipped her crap when I told her and walked straight to the manager like she was on a frickin' mission and said, I'm a director of human resources at Herpaderp. I can't believe you would let him work like this and then threaten him when he wanted to go home sick. I'm going to contact corporate tomorrow for treating your staff in such an inhumane way and for putting your customers' health at risk. 
When he tried to respond, he was bombarded so hard by this red-hot ball of fiery Bostonian rage, I started having Vietnam flashbacks. It was so freaking brutal, I actually felt bad for him. She told me to go home immediately. She even offered to book me an Uber home and promised me there would be no repercussions in any way, shape, or form. I'm six foot tall and at the time was pretty big, but I was honestly so terrified of this five foot nothing woman. I said, yes, ma'am, and walked right out the door without clocking out. This was in front of staff and customers. The silence was palpable and I was in the limelight. I could feel the eyes staring me down as I walked away, nearly crapping my pants from fear and my stomach hurting. I showed up to work a few days later and felt like a freaking rock star because my co-workers had the biggest crap-eating grins on their faces giving me a thumbs up. As I was walking to the back to clock in, I was stopped by this professional-as-hell lady in a nice woman's suit. She sat me down and explained that she was from HR. Basically, I was told to never fear for my employment if I needed to call in sick again and to take one more paid day off to fully recover. I was like, hell yeah. While I was walking out, a coworker stopped me and said, Dude, what's his face? Hasn't been back to work since that night you went home. I'm pretty sure he got fired. I didn't see him again until recently when he was my server at a diner I was eating at. The look on his face was priceless. He went from being a manager at a very successful high-end pub to being my server at the equivalent to a Denny's. Story 3 I'm a Verizon Wireless customer care representative, throwaway for obvious reasons. First, every Verizon customer has a budget for issuing credits. This budget is based on your past billing history and length of service. So if you get charged an overage or if something goes wrong with your bill, your credit comes out of your budget. If you don't have a budget, you'll only get a credit under extreme circumstances. Managers are told to be extremely tight when it comes to issuing credits outside of a customer's budget. We're told to never disclose this information to customers, I'm sure for obvious reasons. Rest assured though, if you've paid your bills on time and have been with Verizon for some time, you'll have quite a bit available in your budget. Second, Verizon store representatives will lie to you and deliberately omit information regarding products and services, often leaving customers with fees and charges which they were never aware of, sometimes leaving them unable to pay. When that happens, the account will go to collections and affect the customer's credit. Now, I understand that personal responsibility plays a role, but when a customer escalates to my supervisor because I have to quote them what amounts to a $3,200 early termination fee because a sales rep did not properly explain that to them, that's a problem. Oh, and Verizon only has a 14-day return window, so by the time you see your first bill, you're already stuck. To be real though, I really like most of Verizon's customers. Like really, 98% of my calls are good, honest people who have some sort of issue they need resolved, and I go out of my way to make sure I help them and see them to the resolution. Heck, I've even talked screaming, frustrated, irate customers down and had them give me good surveys. Oh, some customers at the end of each call get a survey where two questions are asked, whether they felt confident in the resolution they were provided, and whether or not they would want to work with that representative again. If you answer both questions with a yes, the survey is tallied to that agent and they receive a bonus based on the percentage of positive surveys. You can also leave a 30-second message, which the agents can hear, though I honestly don't really listen to mine that often. I typically get two to three positive surveys per day. If you answer a survey in the negative, the survey and call record are sent to your manager for review. And if it's determined that all policies and procedures were followed, the survey can get removed so that it doesn't count against the agent's bonus. We also earn bonuses based on the rate at which we disconnect lines, not suspensions, but total disconnections, the rate at which we transfer a call to another department, and the rate at which customers call back within a three-day period. If you want to be really, really nice to your customer care representative, don't ask them to do things unless you really, really need them. And don't call back within three days of your first call and take a few moments at least to leave the agent a nice message and a good survey. I doubt much of this is particularly shocking. However, it's definitely some inside information that customers aren't supposed to know about. Like I said, I really respect the customers that call in, so hopefully some of this info helps you out a little. And if you're looking to switch to Verizon, give the customer service number a call and get information from them. Don't trust the sales representatives. Story 4. During uni, I used to be a waitress at Pizza Hut. During one really busy shift, the sign outside caught fire, 
and our manager told us not to make a fuss, keep serving, and don't tell anyone. So as the side of the building was on fire, the fire engines turned up and firefighters put the fire out, we all carried on serving pizza. I still don't understand why our manager wasn't fired for putting customer safety at risk. The sign was attached to the building, not just a random one in the road. At the time, 95% of the staff were aged between 16 and 19, me included, and so we didn't really think we could just leave. If that happened to me now, of course I would walk out, and the UK Pizza Hut still has restaurants with waiters and waitresses. We do have fast food pizza huts, but they're more for collection and delivery of takeaways. I heard a lot of their locations in the UK were restaurants. They said they have a pizza buffet during the week, unlimited pizza and breadsticks. Amazing! Now, if this story made you question how the hell nobody noticed the fire, then please do hit that like button and subscribe to my channel. Story 5 I worked as a delivery driver for this Japanese restaurant that had two locations about 10 minutes apart. We only had one delivery driver on duty at a time, and we were not allowed to tell the customers. What sucked about that is that both restaurants had a delivery radius of 5 miles, and sometimes there would be a delivery order at the other location, which was only like one mile away from the house you were supposed to deliver to. But really, it was a longer drive for you since you were like 5 miles away at the other location. Not only would you just get a $2 delivery fee when it should have been $5, but then you had to deal with people angry that their food took so long when they thought you were super close. On top of that, when you were working as a cashier, the only tips you were allowed to keep were the ones left on the table. Any tips left in one of the two tip jars we had or written on credit card receipts in the restaurant went to the owners, not us. It felt nice when people would tip because we provided a good service, but then it felt crappy that you wouldn't see any of that money. Generally, this has to be illegal, right? Like tip stealing? It's not supposed to be for the owners. If it is, really? Story 6 my first retail job was at a specialty giftware and engraving store. The engraving fee covered the first five words, then every word after that was like $2, I think. A normal font came free with any engraving, but a premium font cost $3 extra. We're told to always upsell a premium font, which is fine because most people choose one of those anyway. Two kids came in by themselves wanting to engrave a gift for their mom and dad for Christmas and only had $20 or so to spend. They grabbed a snow globe with an engravable plate and after some finagling on wording and suggesting a normal but still nice looking free font, I had their total to exactly $20. We were also excited about it. The kids had snuck in without their parents to surprise them and I was able to help them out. I did engraving too so I was looking forward to working on it. I sent them up the counter with the order. A few minutes later, I see the two kids looking sad and upset and their dad with his arms crossed standing at the counter. The manager comes up to me and asks if I had done the order properly and why did I tell them it'd only be $20 when it should have been $23? I laughed and said, oh, it's just a normal font, so no extra $3. He looks at me very seriously and says, we charge $3 regardless of if it's normal or premium and that it's always been done this way. I stood my ground and said very loudly, so you're telling me you've been lying to customers and overcharging on every order? When it says right here in the font sample book we show to customers that normal fonts are free and only premium is $3, he admitted that was wrong at least, but I still felt horrible. The surprise had been ruined, the kids' spirits were ruined, the dad was pissed at us. I think they were still charged the $23 because a separate employee put the order through and didn't know the situation. It sounds really minor compared to other stuff here, but it was that incident that got me seeing all of the other shady practices going on in that shop and all the cracks in the management and customer policy. Oh, and I got let go two days after I had been told I'd been kept on as a permanent employee due to someone higher up not doing the paperwork correctly. Then I was unemployed for nearly two years, so yeah, that was cool, I guess. Story 7 that our freaking turkey melts and roast beef melts on freaking fresh house base Yabata were being pre-made, kept in a whole pan in a cooler, and when ordered we were to microwave them, then throw them out on the press till Mark then served. Freaking disgusting. When people ordered the turkey melt, which was turkey, bacon, quarter avocado fanned on top, then jack cheese on top with a chipotle aioli also, and wanted something removed, no bacon, no avocado, whatever, they wanted us to just freaking open up the pre-made sandwich and pull the unwanted item out. 
No chipotle aioli? Ha! Huh. Wiped off. Oh god, I'm getting mad thinking about it. I refused to do it and butted heads with management plenty about it, but would make a fresh one at least. But still be forced to microwave and press it as they took the ingredients off flat top and gave it to the pantry deli station. This was the new owner's decision about a month after fully taking over and deciding that the previous way we served them in a 400 cover restaurant was quote unquote too difficult, a fresh melt right off flat top, quickly warm some freshly sliced and portioned turkey, throw on some fresh bacon, then the avocado slice, and lastly melt the cheese on top with a quick steam, then transfer it to the lovely freshly sliced ciabatta came out amazing. The solution was a freaking cold dead log that barely got heated up in the microwave, then squashed flat in the press. And they had the nerve to up the price a dollar. So many freaking people complained that it was taken off the menu after three weeks after being a classic at this busy restaurant for five years prior. Screw you, Caleb and Jim and your crappy corner-cutting bums. Now this makes me sad. Another beautiful sandwich shop lost to capitalism. Story 8. I work at a car dealership. If your battery was under warranty, there's no way they were going to tell you it tested bad. Even if you were about to leave on a trip, they would rather piss you off and lose you as a customer than replace your battery for free. That is pretty much warranty work in a nutshell, though, as much as I've seen. I saw a car with 8,000 miles on it, and it was leaking trans and oil. Customer wasn't notified. Tire fell off during a test drive, and it was a tech's fault. We'd band-aid that crap together, sometimes almost literally. Your $30,000 car isn't that well put together. Then after that's out of warranty, hey, you need all this work done. Screw American cars. Screw dealerships. Always check your car over before and after you take it in for work. Just because you are taking your car to that fancy dealership doesn't mean they don't give your car to the minimum wage pay tech who's strung out or buzzed. Oh, and if you pay for an alignment, demand the paper saying that they put it on the rack and checked it. It's commonplace where I work to just not do alignments. Oh, and who gets blamed for this stuff when the customer notices? The tech who said something, not the service manager who lied straight to your face. Story 9. I work for an enterprise software company. We sell an identity management solution a lot. About more than 90% of our 12 million customers use us to provision their Office 365 accounts. Essentially, we're pre-federated into the Azure system so we can deploy Office 365 in under an hour. This is a big deal to enterprise accounts where a massive infrastructure migration takes a long time. I recently discovered that our pre-provisioning capability is actually based on us exploiting a weakness in the Microsoft API. Essentially, our entire value proposition is based on a hack. As if that wasn't bad enough, Microsoft has been attempting to meet with our execs and engineering team to solve the issue. Obviously, Microsoft doesn't look good in this situation. And as if that wasn't bad enough, our execs genuinely believe we could strong arm Microsoft into doing what we want, which is to maintain the exploit in their code for our exclusive use and have been refusing to meet with them. The Microsoft legal team, not a phrase you take lightly, have today told us that due to our refusal to meet with them and solve the problem, they will disable our API access within 10 days. So we've got 10 days to figure out a way to completely re-engineer our platform so that the entire email infrastructure of organizations like NASA, the U.S. Marines, and countless hospitals, banks, and service companies keeps working. And oh yeah, we're just about to file to go public too, so all our stock options are potentially worthless. So yeah, my company wants to keep a secret that our customers gave us money to give them a product that only works due to the existence of a code exploit, and we defrauded VCs out of hundreds of millions of dollars to help build our hack platform. And, oh, we've blatantly lied in our SEC filings too, so there's probably fraud in the mix somewhere also. Story 10. I have two. First, I worked at McDonald's and they taught me how to pinch the fry carton just right while putting the fries into them so that it looked full, but actually wasn't. I only had one customer call me out on it. He shook the fries out into his bag and poured them back into the fry carton himself. And it only filled up halfway, so I had to give him more fries. I was both impressed and embarrassed. It's been years and I can still see his face. Second, I worked at an art glass store that sold glass, mostly made in China with very few actual nice pieces. We were told to peel the Made in China stickers off. If anyone asked where the glass came from, we would say New Jersey, which is where the supplier was from. 
I always felt like Danny DeVito and Matilda changing the odometer on his used cars. Now, I find it hilarious that someone would plan their week around when the fry guy at McDonald's works so that they don't get ripped off on their fry order. All right, I hope you enjoyed the video and all the crazy stories in it. And if you made it this far, I'm sure you're also going to enjoy the next one. What's the best way to deal with rude customers? Story three is definitely one we can all learn from. I'll see you in that video, and thank you for watching this one.